Hello everyone, this is Jim, your friend. I'm a cultural historian of early medieval Europe and the late medieval China. Today with me to further our critical remarks that on the final section of uh, Hoge's opening of uh, Hegel's The Science of Logic is my dear friend, Aran. How are you doing, Aran? I'm doing good, Trent. Good to be with you. I'm a philosophy instructor based in Austin. Happy to continue a conversation um, on uh, Hegel Science Pledge. So last episode, we started our first two uh, critical ma major points, to our reservation or our doubts about um, Hegel's uh, overarching principles that manifested, it, that's the way I'll put it, um, in the final section in his the analysis of the relationship between something and other through the concept of a true infinity. And today we're going to continue and raise two more sets of critical remarks. So that's what we're going to do today, right, Aram? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, indeed. What we, did, what we discussed in the uh, last um, um, episode uh, focus uh, around the concept of identity and also uh, transcendence and what um, what we call uh, a tyranny of imminence. And today, what we're going to focus is more directly. All of these things um, came as a result of our um, engagement with uh, the points that Hegel make about something and other and determination, constitution, and infinitude to infinity. Uh, our point uh, today uh, in this episode is going to be uh, twofold as well. One, we're going to focus on the point about finitude and infinity and the relationship between the two. Uh, and the other one is going to be a little bit more meta level and just kind of our uh, on uh, basic level uh, concerns about uh, Hegel's argument here and as uh, it, it exists in um, the entirety of the book um, so far. Now, in the case of uh, uh, finitude, uh, the end of finitude and the relationship between bad infinity and true infinity. Um, one of our uh, confusions here about Hegel's account it is a rather, uh, it, it might be about something in inter interpretive um, case, but I think it's uh, also relevant to what Hegel himself says, which is like, what is the status of bad infinity, right? Because Hegel definitely thinks that bad infinity is something that exists, right? And remember, this whole like, logical development, according to um, Holgate, at least, uh, has some level of like it's like it's, it's the shadow of this logical uh, discussion is actually ontological. Like it's just they they're just working together, right? Now, when we when we get to something like bad infinity. Or, uh, you know, even the uh, progress to infinity. Uh, there is a, there is a question about whether this is uh, just a logical mistake, or it's um, something that goes uh, uh, beyond that. It actually exists as, as an as a necessary part of true infinity, necessary moment of true infinity. Now, um, I think Trent will have more things to say about this relationship. I just wanted to mention something that I find rather um, problematic here about the relationship between finitude and infinity, although I think uh, it's it's something very, it, it, the whole relationship is very interesting as Hegel discusses it. Um, and that is like going back to a very uh, like um, kind of an original point that uh, Trent mentioned many episodes ago and um, the very, very first discussion that we have about this, about the case of polarity, right? We have finitude and then we have infinity. And I'm, I'm not sure how logical this movement is, right? And by that, I mean that if we kind of return to the point of how infinity even comes to, to, to place, is that, okay, finitude is, uh, the you know inherent characteristic of any something, uh, but you know finitude 
means like the demise of something, but the demise cannot lead into absolute nothingness because absolute nothingness is an un unstable logical category. It must have a being. So that just means that we go through the whole process again, which means we have another something, but any something has finitude. So we have finitude after finitude after finitude after finitude. And one something rises and demise, rises, demise, rises, demise. And this is the process. Therefore, Hegel says, um, we need to think about infinity. Why? Um, this reminds me of this kind of a parallel in mathematics, right? That there are a lot of patterns that just go on, right? And, you know, there are conjectures in and mathematics that I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but just something like just making this up that there is, you know, every prime number when it is, you know, uh, this operation is done on it, when it's like um, multiplied by this number and then um, this other operation uh, uh, has ha uh, happens to it, will result in a, an even number, whatever, right? And there are such conjectures in uh, mathematics and you start like trying them out. There is no immediate proof for them to try them out. And it fascinatingly enough, um, like uh, there are a lot of these conjectures that like work till, you know, whatever, the 10th uh, billionth prime number. And suddenly with that prime number, it doesn't work. Right? It's just like it ends. Um, it, it wasn't all prime numbers, it was the first 10 billion prime numbers, right? I want to make that parallel to with the finitude thing, right? And what, why shouldn't we consider that, oh, okay, okay, like there is a finite number of finite things demising and something else happens at the end of this. Like, where did we get this idea that, okay, this must be infinite? Like, where's the justification for that? I don't see any justification for that. Um, justification in a sense that there is any necessity of um, introducing infinity. You could say, okay, we don't have any reason to, you know, say that, you know, finite beings turn into one another up until this number. Uh, so therefore, let's talk about infinity. That's not a justification. Um, that's just evading the question. Now, the, the, the one thing that comes to my mind is that like Hegel would, might, might say that if you think there is an end to this end, then you need to kind of uh, um, go back to the idea of absolute nothingness. Right, and because absolute nothingness is impossible, then this process must go at infinitum. This might be might be the justification that I don't see it directly in the text, um, which then kind of like pushes back the problem that they have um, to the problem of absolute nothingness. There is something in Hegel that is interesting and fascinating to me, which is that he thinks, or at least in Hegel's interpretation, uh, it is implied that uh, there cannot, the world must exist, right? Like being is not an accident because nothingness um, is impossible, right? I find that fascinating. I don't have much to say about it, but I think this point about finitude leading to infinity cannot be justified unless we attribute it to this impossibility of nothingness, which itself is a problematic claim, but may at least kind of push us back to discuss nothingness instead of discussing um, infinity. That's what I have about this but i think trend you got a couple of more points here wow. and so feel free to talk about all of them. right right mine is not an exactly a critical remark it's just an observation of um parallels in the early um, mahayana buddhist philosophy but i what you just said um inspired a certain thought in me so i'll say that first 
I think what you said that the move from series of the finer things to the concept of infinity is not like sound or not like a proven or not demonstrated to be the only alternative. I I share that kind of um, sense of being disturbed or like an unsettling effect. That it seems to me the concept of infinity. First of all, is a singular, uniform concept, and it's an abstraction of the, its opposite, namely finite. However, like if you, because you mentioned math, and that in math there are like basically a whole hierarchy of infinite numbers and the infinity. So, how do we know this infinity proposed in this logical move? Exhausts all the possible, say, opposites or not necessarily. Op yes, alternatives to that finite conceptualization of uh being. It, it seems yet again a act of a polarization that we already have something we could like speak very firmly about because we are trapped in it and we know this cannot remain the case. Hence, its opposite must be a helpful, at least a logical category, an expedient means with which we contrast the two, synthesize the two, or sublate the two to move to the next ground. That move does not seem justified to me. That's what I like thought like after while hearing what you just said. And the uh, now move to the parallels. This is um I think this is both the parallels also kind of raises the questions on the really, in my eyes, quite, it's fascinating, but also puzzling for me personally, a relationship, triangular relationship between the um, alt in something as a resistance to, to externally impose or external tax, as you mentioned. That's the first thing. Second would be bad infinity, and the third would be true infinity. And uh, in early Mahayana Buddhist texts from basically the beginning of the um, coming era, like uh, one key tenant is kind of shared across all different schools. So that's major distinction between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism, namely the concept of uh, emptiness, or uh, in Sanskrit it's called a sunyata. And this emptiness is basically pointing out that nothing really has immutable intrinsic identity or nature. Because if you observe things, the things are always impermanent. Okay. And later on in the scholastic or doctrinal development, a specific um, a, a variation of this sunyata or emptiness that develops, namely uh, sunyata, sunyata. That is literally means the emptiness of emptiness. That means like even this understanding of like everything does not have a permanent nature or identity. This whole conceptualization, this so-called doctrine of emptiness must also be criticized and be deconstructed basically. And in that, I, in my eyes, it has a great parallel with both bad infinity and something's ought, because they are like in reaction to either internal or external critique of their like identity or determination, they assert that something asserts something which beyond its own capacity. Namely, they create something like that it does not demise, that has nothing to do with the finitude, hence it's not true or it does not speak to reality and as a result it must be like deconstructed or criticized using the buddhist philosophical language so that's a um great parallels i observe and um so in that sense do these two like one is external one internal um alt and as well as the bad infinity uh, are, are are the two really that different in the sense of what they try to achieve, are they just like a certain logical steps towards the next stage of like being true infinity? And um, it seems, I don't know, 
it does it does not seem Hegel's approach towards the true infinite it does not seem the only way we can arrive that because like we can get rid of that uh, internal external distinction I'm not sure I haven't done the <laughs> logical proof myself but it, it, it seems the Buddhist approach Mahayana approach points out a alternative a possible alternative the same thing could be um, achieved without that rigid like polarized the internal versus the external attack the decay thing which you mentioned both here and in our previous episode so i think that's a like parallel worth mentioning yeah that's all i got yeah that's that's interesting i, I mean i definitely need to uh, delve into this more if we don't have i don't have enough knowledge to pass a very uh, coherent uh, judgment on it but yeah i think it, it is yeah, like with my very very uh like rudimentary and knowledge of um some buddhist traditions it is interesting to me like especially when we think when we, when it comes to the concept of nothing or emptiness uh i, I think juxtaposing he hegel's approach um in general uh with uh with these uh Kind of radically different approaches in the sense of like a tradition, right? Because Hegel is part of this tradition that is not really uh, at least any any direct way influenced by the Buddhist uh, tradition. Um, I wonder uh, what happens, not in a boring a scholarly comparison uh, of Hegel's concept of nothingness and uh, Buddhist uh, em emptiness, but a comparison that uh, could potentially move them both and uh, kind of um, um, make us think about this better because there is something about thinking about nothing that yeah like going back to the point about the kind of articulability there is something there that to me sounds like um potentially escapes in a usual form of articulation and i think that something is that the, the buddhist tradition will uh, recognize that this is for Hegel, this is just another concept uh, like that kind of gets absorbed in the process. Um, but I wonder, I wonder if that's the and uh, that's the reaction to go with. Yeah, yeah, just uh, what you said. I, I, th I think the parallels is not trivial. It might lead to precisely what you just said and to move both because the concerns we have with Hegel I think are acknowledged in certain Buddhist schools. For instance, like in their concept of wisdom inside prana, the foundation of it is a non-dualistic vision of the world, which corresponds quite neatly to what our overarching beef about like Hegel's polarized thinking and that your mention of like applicability that the the cultivation of like wisdom so to speak uh, in certain traditions at least were done through say what experiential learning instead of like l l verbal like linguistic learning so if we were to imagine that like a buddhist master like or had access to like hegel's text he would probably or she would probably raise a similar questions to Hegel and I think a meaningful conversation could have taken place and 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 I don't know what kind of a great insight could emerge out of it and we can definitely make it our next like uh, video project stuff like that yes but I think we said enough about this like shall we just move on yes yes definitely we can uh, we can move on very very briefly I think it's the point because you point uh, you pointed non-duality and I think uh, like uh, Hegel's charm in the history of Western philosophy is that he is his champion as the person of kind of like overcoming and uh, dualities. Uh, but it is interesting of uh, it is interesting to see how the, uh, how his version of overcoming duality um, kind of compares with with something like the non duality of uh, the Buddhist tradition, because as we talked last time, I think it's. It's very different to overcome duality um, than saying that the duality is subsumable under a unity as moments of that kind of top level 
uh, category or process. And I think that that's Hegel's, Hegel's way of overcoming is to say, these two things that you thought are very different are actually part of the same thing. Fine, but that to me is not eradication of duality. It's think, rethinking duality as not absolutely opposed, but moments of the same thing, but mm -hmm. it's still distinct. Uh, I think that's that's something that is uh, like not ju only juxtaposing with uh, like Buddhism, but I think some uh, Islamic mystic uh, mm -hmm. traditions and uh, understanding of duality and uh, the non-duality. I think that's going to be fascinating. Anyhow, uh, the last thing that we have uh, here is some like kind of metal level concerns. And metal level concerns have been our thing as we have uh, exposed to you our uh, critical concerns in general. And um, these are, you know, uh, there is nothing necessarily um, absolutely new about these concerns that we have. They just kind of repeated themselves in, in these last bit of um, the opening of Hegel's logic as well. Our main point here, I think, at this middle level is that when we're looking at science of logic, what are we looking at? Let's say all the arguments of Hegel's science of logic make sense, right? Which is a very you know, bold claim. But let's say if that makes sense. Even if it makes sense, I'm still not sure what I'm looking at, right? And in this last bit, there was one point that Holgate mentioned in the passing that, you know, it's like existence of self-consciousness is not an accident in nature, it's a necessity, right? And that kind of like triggered the same type of a skepticism that I've had from the very beginning, that just because we need to impose a concept necessarily to be able to make sense of a process, that's a jump to say that this is uh, something about na like nature itself. Like it might be the case that we cannot think through nature unless we, um, you know, impose these conceptual like schemes. That doesn't mean that nature must be that exhaustively, right? There's like this, we have, we have just found nature suddenly, right? And I think that's in the more scholarly sense, like, and, and Holgate mentions this about the uh, Holgate versus Pippin, Robert Pippin. And I think um, in, in some cases, I am uh, more sympathetic to Pippin here in the sense that I think this project, project of logic, cannot be automatically thought as an ontological claim about the world. Um, now, we can, we can think about how this kind of logical necessity of our thinking um, is, could be related to the world, but we have talked about this in a, in a different sense, and I think it's relevant to kind of bring it back in a sense that the like, uh, working hypothesis is not a justified conclusion, right? We might be saying that, okay, we, we need to suspend the sharp distinction between thinking and being. It doesn't mean that now everything that we have arrived at automatically means, you know, it is appli applicable to, to being as well as thought. Um, we need a lot more and to, to make, uh, make that claim. And um, so to me, Hegel's logic is a project of conceptual clarification and part of that conceptual clarification is about you know even thinking about our limit how that could possibly make sense and how it could be nonsensible in in a lot of ways uh, but to think of this as uh, ontologically accurate immediately um is not valid to me uh, I, I don't see, I need an extra argument for that and that I don't see um, so far. Maybe that's something that just like a full circle needs to be developed and at the end we're going to see it, but I haven't seen it yet. 
I, I cannot accept it now. And this also, uh, this is the last point that I'm going to send, then we go to trend. Like in terms of the finitude and infinity, we talked about this kind of a polarity, but this is somehow like also kind of the return of Gadamer's concerns or linguistic concerns. And I mean, if you remember the Gadamer's point about ego science of logic, this is all great. However, this is about kind of like a more like a cultural clarification. And in the sense of these are the concepts that are used in the you know German speaking world. And what Hegel does is to kind of like go ahead and just do a, you know, conceptual clarification. It's not about being as this kind of like trans culturally transcending entity um, that we are discovering. We are kind of, we're dealing with a German confusion, right? Now, I'm not saying that this, I agree with Gottheimer's point about the German part of this uh, in the sense that I don't think the, Clarification of German confusion is not so distinct from uh, clarification of Iranian uh, or Farsi uh, confusion, perhaps. Uh, I am sympathetic to about, like, in general, some presuppositions in within this whole system that are coming from various spaces and language is only one of them right language like this specific language is one of them we talked about this before when we we're talking about Nietzsche and talking about like languages that do not have this kind of a very strong uh, presence of subject like this is you know this is an important fact uh, that there that is an important element um just like you know, a, a different language or different culture may have a far more immediate understanding of many alternatives to finitude than infinity, which I'm not aware of now. But that doesn't mean that that should be rejected. This kind of reduction of reason to um, rules of inference that are warranted partially uh, because of the linguistic structure of you know this family group of um, languages is something that needs to be um, uh, looked at critically. Overall, um, something that you know uh, may not be just a criticism of Hegel, but it's a relevant point, is that when we think about this whole claim of imminence, that one concept leads to one another um, uh, and then leads to another just automatically, I think. Um, I am suspicious of this claim in the sense that there, in this movement, there is an implicit inference that if this happens, then something happens. And that rule of inference is, it's just, there is some pre-logic and uh, pre-logic logic that needs to be there that tells us that if, you know, if being ends up you know, collapsing into nothing and nothing ends up into being, that means that these two are not um, fully pure and, and different. They must be part of the same thing. It's an inference. And that inference is not, the, that rule of inference was not justified by Hegel anywhere. And true, this takes us into a very kind of a strange path of, you know, any, any why in front of rules of inference uh, could only be answered by a different set of rules of inference. And this seems to be a human condition problem that like we all, you know, justification for rules of inference need rules of inference and so on and so forth. I'm mentioning that to, to say that this might not be Hegel's problem per se, but if the claim here is uh, imminence and presuppositionless in imminent development of concepts, we should have an answer about what these rules of moving from one to the other are. And I think the point about language now is far bigger than just German. It's about how language kind of embodies these rules of inference. And Hegel just takes it for granted that the rules of inference is what we need to uh, stick to. Because to me, there is no meaning to being turning into nothing or collapsing into nothing or becoming explicit as nothing with no inference. Like I, I, I have no 
understanding of why I should accept that. Uh, ironically, the only way that I could understand that I should understand, I can understand that is to think of this as some sort of a, actually not a reasonable leap, like just like a, you know, I just move to the other way. It's just a move to, as a form of like a revelation, but that's definitely not what Hegel wants to do. Um, then what is this? What is this uh, like free logic logic and that ties us to a certain set of inferences, a certain set of polarities in language, certain concepts that happen to exist within a culture and juxtaposing this with Hegel, thinking of this as the project of reason. How much of this is uh, actually um, accurate and, and uh, defensible? I, I think there, there are serious, um, I, uh, serious problems here. Yes, I love the points you said. And um, you talked about the pre-logic logic, but my point, I think, is the afterlife of logic in the sense of like, what is this? The whole project of the science of logic, does it, it's a thinking about being, right? But there's no clear distinction between, or separation between being and thinking. Therefore, like, does the whole body of knowledge produced that in this whole process has the status of being or like something and like if so it remains once it's articulated and formalized in such a way as Hegel puts it is it something is it like a bad infinity is it odd or is it a true infinity I'm like thinking about this I don't know maybe the, he has a status for it and later on it could be the absolute i don't know because i i think of this not just as a joke or like a tongue-in-cheek comment because it yet again in early mahayana not really medieval mahayana lots of a specific school called uh, yogacara they see sound to the emptiness of emptiness um idea and further develops it set into like different stages of the construction of uh, like uh, things attributed with permanent um, relevance or identity. And the final one is actually the knowledge of the emptiness of emptiness. That knowledge itself needs to be deconstructed because it itself lacks that permanent existence or intrinsic identity. So like, I'm just thinking if we were to breathe life into the whole science of logic project, like, how are we going to situate this knowledge proposed by Hegel? Like, are we accor according it with uh, ontological status or is it just a matter of like conceptual clarification, hence strictly in the realm that, the realm that is beyond being? I don't know. I think it's not a irrelevant question if we are to say that Hegel's project of science is both like meaningful and relevant to our time. Yes, that's all I had to say at the very end. And and uh, just to kind of like uh, uh, just add the final point uh, in response to what you said, like I think uh, all of these kind of like presuppositions we can call it mm. and that Hegel has, um, that we think there is um, something about these presuppositions that are um, it's relevant that these presuppositions exist and this it's relevant these presuppositions are um are there and un unacknowledged. I think there is something about you know thinking about um articulation and thinking about articulation in language, thinking about all of these concepts in this way with these rules of inference uh, that are actually very, very valued. I think the part of this that uh, remains very um, unsatisfying to me is the claim of uh, exhaustibility. The claim that this is exhausting um, a logic of being, like something of that kind, right? It's just like, that is, like I can see that relative to Hans critical pure reason, for instance, how much more imminence we see in Hegel's science of logic, right? Kant doesn't even try to kind of uh, like derive concepts in the same way. But that doesn't mean Hegel 
Hegel's project is absolutely imminent, or is the is the possible it's possible to have such an uh, absolute um, absolutely imminent um, uh, inquiry. And the last thing I'm going to say is that like the suspicion about Hegel's project is not one of those suspicions that like you know it just immediately lands us in the opposite realm that oh there is no truth in language or just we are not suddenly in the absolute opposite of hegel because i i find that as un, unjustified as hegel's like it's not like that this is necessarily a point that is you know uh like something like you know a rejection of, of uh, objectivity like leads you to relativism suddenly right um but it's i i find the same or it's very similar problems with any a kind of contrasting approach um, to Hegel uh, as well, and and yeah, and I think a lot of the conceptual clarifications, even the ones that we don't agree with in this process, um, have brought interesting questions to our minds, and I think we're we're going to continue um, uh, discussing those and exploring those um, in different dimensions. Yes, I think with that we can conclude our really final concrete episode on um, Hogate's book on Hegel's Science of Logic. It's been a great pleasure to learn from you, Aron, and from you, like our dear listeners. Stay attuned. Thank our, you, Tom. Okay. Stay attuned. Our final summary or overview of the whole book in which we will like lay out our understanding of what this Hogate's book is set to be, and um, we will run, take your hands through the whole like process of a progress of, of being from a sheer immediacy all the way through true uh, infinity uh, in the uh, most concise, I hope, way possible. So stay attuned. Our summary is coming up.